Hello, everyone. Um, so what we're looking at right now is a, is a live stream of the library's 180 gallon uh, mixed reef saltwater aquarium. Uh, you say mixed reef because you can see that there's fish, there are soft corals that are waving around, and there are also hard corals um, that have a more uh, hard skeleton structure made of calcium. Um, the library got the tank um, in 2001, um, so it, it predates many of us that take care of it. Um, and uh, in 2001, when we when the library got the fish tank, um, which was before Finding Nemo, the movie, the but the blue tang that's swimming in the current right now in the front of the tank. And the two yellow tanks, those were both, or all three of those were in the tank in 2001 when we, when we bought it. So they're at least 19 years old, um, which is a, a very good, um, it's a very good lifetime for the fish. We're, we're very happy that they're still with us, but it, we like to think we do a good job taking care of them and because that's longer than average for most of these fish. Um, so I, I have some slides that I kind of want to switch back and forth between. Not that the video feed isn't um, fun, but it's hard to get all the pictures that we want using a camera without being in the building. So I wanted to um, switch to a PowerPoint here. Uh, okay, so uh, just to kind of give a an overview of what we were looking at in the fish tank, um, this is a screenshot from earlier um, from the feed. And you can see right here this big thing here, that's a toadstool um, coral. And then you have this big expanse of finger leather coral over on this side of the tank. And you'll see just how much it's grown over the years uh, when I look at some other slides. Um, he's not on the camera right now, but this right here, there's a turbo snail in the picture on the left of the tank. And that snail's foot that attaches to the glass there is at least an inch and a half. I think he's a, more like a two inch snail. Um, He's a big boy and goes around and cleans the glass for us. Um, also on that side of the tank and down near the bottom, there are lots of hairy mushrooms. Um, there are scientific names for a lot of these corals and, and you'll find some posters. When you can visit the building, there's some posters with their scientific names. Um, then down here at the bottom, there's also a a cabbage leather that you'll see that uh, when we switch back to the video feed that moves around in the the water current as well and then um, here the gorgonian label that this branch right here as well as on the other side of the toadstool those are uh, photosynthetic gorgonians um, originally from the caribbean but they're uh, very popular in the aquarium hobby because they look very nice and flowing back and forth in the water. And the uh, the other coral that I have labeled out here is the Anthalia, or they call it waving hands coral. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that later, but it has little polyps that just flow back and forth in the water. Um, so this is another picture of the um, the photosynthetic gorgonian. Um, this is when it was very young when we first uh, got it from some trimmings, which probably came out of another fish keeper's tank. Uh, gorgonians are definitely one that don't get harvested from the wild because they grow plentifully in tanks and 
you just trim some off and uh, then you can attach it to rocks similar to how they might tumble around in the Caribbean and attach to a rock and just start growing there. Also in this photo, you can see big blue um, and some, uh, these are called uh, frog spawn. Um, it's a type of euphelia. That's a hard coral there. It has a hard skeleton underneath. And then a, these are large polyp. So these are big, soft parts of the coral attached to a, a hard skeleton. I just want to advance to a different shot of the um, Gorgonian um, up close. Uh, Gorgonians, like many corals, are uh, they fall into an, some level of symmetry. I believe Gorgonians are um, eight-way symmetrical. So the, these tiny little hands that you're that are kind of hands um, that are popping out of the coral, um, they gather sunlight, but they also grab particulates and food out of the water. But when the coral is stressed or just occasionally um, as part of a sort of cleaning itself, all of those little polyps disappear and get or pulled back inside of the, um, the coral's main body. So this and that are the same coral, just very different views. Um, you can see there's a a green chromis or two green chromises in the background, as well as on the, the right side of the tank is the uh, finger leather again. So that big coral in this, the center of the tank, the toadstool, this is um, seven years ago, the, the fragment of coral that we, we bought or that we're, we probably traded um, so one of our coral pieces as they overgrow, you trade them in in the hobby and give them to other people and get coral from their tanks. And that way you don't have to harvest, you can sort of share the wealth. Um, there's scientific names for many of these corals that I can't pretend to pronounce. So we go with toadstool leather. And there on the right side, you'll see the anthalia or the waving hands. And that coral has spread very much over this entire area of rock. Um, this is that same coral uh, when its hands are partially retracted. Um, you can also see how this toadstool coral is retracted and sort of um, bunched up. And then in the next photo, it's open and its polyps are out and enjoying life. But the anthalia next to it, its palm palms are pulled in. And it can actually get even smaller than that where those long pink tubes fully retract. Um, but I don't know that I have any photos of that. Um, here's another shot. I believe this would be sometime in 2013 or 2014. We did have a sea urchin the down, you can see on the glass, the other side of the tank. Um, we had the urchin for quite a few years. Um, I know, I, I think we had it for at least 10 years, but at some point he did age out and he's no longer with us. Um, Um, there's another shot of the green chromis. I, those um, came to, we got those in our tank in uh, 2013 as well. And there's one of our clownfish. Another picture showing a, very, a rather small um, finger leathers. And uh, the, the very small at the bottom of the tank there, the, um, the 
gorgonian and as well as up here there's another gorgonian and you can see that flash of yellow there one of our tangs here's another picture from as i looked at old photos of the tank it was quite the the change of cameras that i had available to me and the, the quality of the pictures just keeps going up the, the newer the photos are um, Here's another picture of the tank, which if anyone has seen the tank in person um, recently, or even the video feed from the other side, you, you can tell that these, these corals are not fake. They, they grow quite a bit and uh, trimming them and trading them into other fish keepers is sort of part of keeping a fish tank or a coral, a living coral reef. Um, we do have some things in, in addition to corals that are uh, born in the tank and, and grow. Um, on the right side here, I, I believe these are baby Astraea snails uh, that were born in the tank. Uh, I, I would probably put them right there at about a quarter inch. Um, and on the, the left side, you can see a, a tiny um, brittle star, as they're called. They're a type of starfish, but with much longer, skinny legs. Um, another thing that grows very readily in the tank, and uh, if you've ever been in the library during a feeding, you'll see these bristle worms. Um, they actually live inside the rocks and uh, many times you could visit the tank and not see the bristle worms, but as soon as they smell food in the water, they will come pouring out of the rocks and they don't hurt living creatures, but if there's any extra food or nutrients in the tank, they will they will come out and try and capture it. Um, we feed a mixture of um, pellets as well as seaweed and um, frozen food, like a very tiny shrimp and other bits of um, clams and other things. And the fish love it, but the, the, the bristle worms they love it as well and definitely show up to try and get their part of the feast. Um, there's some more photos of the bristle worms just pouring out of the, t of the rocks. Um, I, the, this is a picture, I, I come in over Christmas break to help um, check on the fish and make sure everything's okay. And uh, I thought this looked really neat. This, the, there's algae growing on the glass, um, but the snail here is doing his part to clean off a section of the glass. Um, here's another somewhat recent photo of the tank. You can see the different mushrooms. Um, they don't really move, but they also aren't completely static. They might leave, move very slowly around the tank. And if there's like a sharp rock or something, a little bit of them might get left behind. And then a new mushroom will grow from that piece. And that's part of the way that we've ended up with so many mushrooms throughout the tank will also split themselves in half as another way to um, get more mushrooms. Um, as you can see in these um, photos that there, there's sort of columns of light as you could also see in the video feed. Um, aquarium technology 
has come a long way um, since the library first got the tank almost 20 years ago. Um, so now we're using energy efficient LED lighting um, to light the tank. It also lets us um, fade the lights in and you know, have a full midday sun. And then as evening comes, the lights fade back out. And so we can give the, um, it, I like it because we can also give the tank a little bit of light at nighttime or you know, later into the evening since the library doesn't really close with our old fluorescent tube lights, they were either on or they were off. There was, there was not a, a faded gentle glow um, one thing that the the lights and especially the LEDs do make difficult though is the high power blue LEDs and most cameras do not mix well. And so many of the colors that you see um, are not true to life as you would know standing in front of the tank. Um, oh, so. I, We'll jump ahead to, so I wanted to show off some of our filtration equipment, um, some other new things. So on the left is our old filter um, sump. So there's the tank itself, and which is the part, the display tank that, that you see. And then underneath it is the, they call it a sump. And um, that's where we store, we have all of the filtration equipment so that it doesn't, you know, you're not seeing it in the tank. Uh, it's also nice to have it all in one place. You don't have to worry so much about it being loud or ugly. You just, you have room for the equipment. Um, so this tank on the left, the, the old sump, that was very much a, um, you know, late 90s, early 2000s style of filtration. Um, but there's been a lot of advances in understanding of how the tanks, how saltwater aquariums work and what, what you need to keep the water in the tank healthy and stable for the creatures living in the tank. Um, so this is our new sump on the, the photo on the right. And in, in the back, uh, you can see we have some outlets and the the aquarium has a controller brain um, uh, that has a bunch of different sensors and um, it controls every bit of the tank as well as monitoring it, giving me alerts if anything's out of the ordinary. Um, so the as you can these pumps uh, the on the back as well, those are peristolic pumps that similar to what you might use for in, in medicine, um, but instead these are dosing um, calcium for the corals to grow and um, alkalinity, which I realized <laughs> I didn't send those words to the interpreters in advance. But um, so we used to, when we first got the tank, and for many years, we would every day someone would uh, get a little measuring cup out and you, you'd put, you know. 25 milliliters of this chemical in and you dump it in the tank and then maybe you would wait five minutes and then measure out 25 milliliters of a different chemical and add it to the tank and um, you know you would add, need to add uh, water evaporates from the tank so you would need to add fresh water um, we only add fresh water because the salt doesn't evaporate um, where we used to add fresh water manually. And now with the controller system, um, we have a, a float sensor that um, when the water level gets low in the sump, it automatically runs a pump to add fresh water back into the system so that the salt level stays consistent, which keeps all the inhabitants happy. Um, you can see this column of white here that's called a protein skimmer and it uh, blows millions of little bubbles into the water and um, proteins and other sort of scum stick to the bubbles and rise to the top of the protein skimmer and then 
this basket at the top uh, lets us take all that scum and get rid of it. Um, uh, several of the librarians have been near the sink when I've cleaned out the uh, protein skimmer collection basket and they will tell you that it is not a fresh smell. Um, let's see what else. Uh, another thing that we have in our, uh, our new sump is an area, and this is a more modern fish keeping trend, is to have um, a grow light here and we'll grow algae, uh, a specific kind of um, macro out, just large algae in this part of the tank um, with this very bright grow light so that um, the excess nutrients that are in the water get used up by algae that's easy for us to control. We just take that piece of that algae, sort of rip it out and throw it away. And that's a way to get nutrients like the you know, we're adding nutrients with the fish food. The fish turn that into fish poop, and um, that breaks down in the water. But the, this macro algae lets us grow algae using the nutrients from the fish poop um, and help keep the water clean. Um, you can also see there's the, the blue, there's a pH probe here as well as temperature probes. Um, we it, control the, um, the heaters that, that monitor the temperature of the tank. Uh, there's also some cooling fans um, that, you know, if, if the tank gets too warm, um, which happens less frequently with the newer LED lights, but um, if the tank gets too warm, we can cool it. And, uh, for the most part, uh, we heat the tank with um, a 300 watt heater. Uh, but sometimes uh, when the building is closed and it's the middle of winter, um, there's uh, two backup heaters and they will kick in and we might have 900 watts of electricity heating the tank if it gets really cold or something. But we like to keep the temperature fairly stable for them. There is a little bit of a, a rise and fall in the daylight, but that is also relatively natural. Um, and we're talking about uh, you know, two to three tenths of a degree, so less than a, a degree of temperature swing. Um, and so let's go, that's the end of the, the prepared. Um, slideshow that I made and we can go back to the live tank view and blues still there um, swimming in the current he does uh, blue tangs are very sort of playful fish uh, there's lots of different stories online as, as well as in in the RIT libraries where people will see blue or a blue tang wedged in the rocks and think maybe he's stuck um, and he, he's not stuck. He, he wants to be there. He, he'll take a break from his swimming and rest in the rocks, similar to how he might, they might rest in the rocks from the waves in the, in the wild. And then he'll pop out again and um, play in the current. Um, so um, as you can see, uh, th on the side of the tank there, you can't, I guess you can't really see it, but there's a little sticker um, on the left side of the tank uh, where there's a magnet, um, asking people not to steal our magnet because the magnet holds a pump in place and uh, that pump is just cir circulating the water through the tank. There's one on the left side of the tank as well as one on the right side of the tank, and they sort of create a spiral inside the tank. Um, but they do have different modes. So let me, so if I turn off, there's a little bit of a lag between what I, when I click things in my control system and what the video feeds show. Um, 
And I have to remember that I'm looking at the tank backwards. So there, I, I turned off the pump. And you can see that now Blue's bored with that now. It'll just swim away. And I think he, he wants the current to come back. So I'll, I'll turn it back on for him. Um, another mode that we have just um, to keep things interesting in the tank. Uh, um, so now you can see that the tank, the two pumps on either side of the tank can work in unison and they'll create a, a rocking pattern in the, in the, in the water. So you can see that the corals kind of bouncing back and forth, swaying. Um, the, the tank automatically does that, I believe, for a minute or two every hour or two, just to keep the water moving. And the, 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 the power heads do have different schedule power settings during the day and during the night. We don't want the, the fish to need to swim their hardest all day long. So the, the current slows down a little bit at night to give them somewhat of a rest. Um. Anyone you have any other any questions? Um, as you can kind of tell, like I was saying earlier, the um, the blue lights make it somewhat hard to capture. If I let the camera decide how the tank should look, everything's very blue because it it doesn't know what to make of all that intense light. Um, but if I take back control, I can manually adjust the white balance um, and make the colors look a little visible. We do have a question from Jake. Um, why does blue swim sideways? Uh, Blue has, I, I don't know uh, why specifically sideways. He can swim vertically. Um, he does frequently, but he, he's been swimming sort of sideways like that on and off for, for years. Um, one thing we, we will say about Blue is if you see him up close, um, his skin is not quite as perfect as it was uh, in some of the older photos, but, but Blue is a 20 year old fish. And um, we, we try to do the best by him, but at, at, at 20, uh, his, his skin and some of the fins aren't quite as perfect as they used to be. Um, but it is, I've done quite a bit of research and that's relatively to be expected. Um, the, the fish uh, do seem to get along. Um, they, the they'll occasionally be spats, but there's quite a bit of rock work in the tank, um, and that gives them a chance to have some privacy. They can get away from the other fish if they want. There was some time where um, I don't I don't know a lot about the the fishes. Um, we haven't taken blue out. We call him a him. I don't actually know he's a him, but the yellow tangs, I assume that the larger one is the female and the smaller one is the male. Generally, that's how that works. And there was a time like two years ago where after the yellow tangs were together for, you know, 18 years, um, the female was, was chasing the, the male and was just picking on him and he stayed hidden in the rocks for like two weeks. And then, um, then she decided to stop picking on him and they uh, swim around and very friendly again. Justin, I don't know if you saw the question, how many fish do we have in a tank? So um, I have to count them out. 
I, I had a list somewhere. Uh, there's three tangs. I believe there's three or four clownfish. Um, five chromis. Uh, and a leopard, a, a yellow wrasse. Um, so I would say that there are uh, 12 fish in the tank, um, as well as maybe around eight astrea snails. Those are the ones that I think um, breed in the tank. And hundreds or thousands of bristle worms as well as I believe at least three of the turbo snails. That was the giant zebra snail. Um, and we do also have a, a new urchin. Um, there's, as more people are interested in conservation uh, and trying to keep sustainable aquariums, um, captive breeding has becoming more of a thing. Um, so we have a captive bred tuxedo urchin. Uh, he's probably an inch and a half right now, so he's not very visible on the camera. Um, but he moves around the tank and eats algae and whatnot. I saw a question about trading corals, and the, the main reason that you trade corals is, um, I mean, there's, there's definitely money involved, but for the most part, it's your, the corals keep growing and, and we have a, a, a fixed size aquarium to hold the corals. So you need to trim them or else they will um, uh, bump into each other and start a sort of coral war of chemicals um, stinging each other. Uh, you, can, you can see some part of that right now in the middle of the tank. Um, Right, right behind blue, uh, you can see the the fresh the you can see the the gorgonian there, and you can see how um, the tips of the gorg have the polyps extended, but you can see a little bit of the main stalk skeleton there in the middle without polyps, and that's because the uh, the coral behind it uh, grew close enough that they touch each other. And they sting each other. So if, if you were to not trim the corals, um, then they would crash into each other and fight each other and die. And we, we don't want that. So we, we mostly, um, the library does have a, a vendor that, that, we, that takes care of the tank for us um, as far as water changes and, and making sure that we have food and chemicals. And they'll they'll take the corals from us and um, bring us different corals. Or, you know they'll put them through quarantine and um, make sure they're healthy. And then um, there you go. So the I uh, I didn't st I started taking care of the the library tank, um, helping take care of it in uh, 2013, and. Um, uh, uh, another a librarian recently retired that had been taking helping take care of the tank since 2001, uh, but I joined Gus and in caring for the tank. And I then more recently got a saltwater tank of my own at home and uh, learned a lot about corals and they call it fragging corals or fragmenting them. Um, and the uh, each coral does have a different sort of method that you would use to fragment it. Um, something like the, the Gorgonian, um, you, you literally just cut it with scissors or a razor blade, and then um, you'll have the stem, sort of a stick of coral, and then you take a piece of rock that you want to mount the coral on, and I drill a little hole in it, and you use super glue and you super glue the coral fragment to the rock. And then, then it, there you go. It starts growing and it will grow down over the super glued area 
and just really firmly grow itself attached to the rock. Other corals, like mushrooms, are very slimy. Um, and you could try to super glue them to something, but they would not stick. They would just ooze and keep on moving. Um, you also can't quite so easily cut part of a, a mushroom um, off. You can, in theory, uh, cut them up, but that's something that I've never done. I've never, I'm not in the, we're not in the business of, of fragmenting mushrooms or corals. So I, that is something that's done. Other hard corals, like plating corals, uh, you might break a piece off accidentally when you're moving the tank around and um, there you go, that's a new coral frag. You just kind of super glue it to a piece of rock and it just keeps growing. Um, the Anthalia, the, the waving hands, they, they spread like a weed almost across the surface of rocks and you can kind of just peel them off by gently grabbing a hold of their, their base and uh, pull them back. And the, the base of the coral is a different sort of organic structure than the soft um, oozy part at the top. And you can, you can super glue them to coral or to rocks and have a new, new piece of coral. Um, the leather fingers or the finger leather on the left side of the tank, as well as the um, toadstool, those are um, sinularian. I'm not, it, it's sort of a species, a, a branch of a family of corals, and they are also very slimy. Uh, and the way that most people fragment them is uh, you either a piece would fall off naturally as it gets too big, which happens quite often with our toadstool. Or um, you can trim a piece again with just a razor blade and then maybe rubber band it to a rock. Or what I generally do at home is uh, you take a toothpick to sort of gently hold the piece in place and um, use a rubber band to hold the toothpick to the rock and then wait, you know, two, three, four weeks and the coral will have grown um, itself to the rock. And then you can remove the toothpick and the rubber band. None of the fish that we have uh, uh, appear to be attempting to reproduce in the tank. Um, at home, I have clownfish that do very regularly every four weeks. Um, they'll clean off an area. They actually do it on a, a pipe one of the filter pipes in the tank, they'll clean off an area, pick it clean, and then they'll lay, uh, she'll lay, you know, hundreds of little eggs and uh, attach to the pipe. And then, um, you know, they'll grow and then you can see their little eyes. But if you aren't ready to uh, capture them, uh, they'll get washed away into the tank. Um, the parents may eat them, corals may eat them, it just a little snack when they're very, very, very tiny. Um, the yellow, none of the other fish uh, generally reproduce in captivity easily. In the, in the past uh, less than five years, there's been some big um, advances in um, breeding, captive breeding uh, saltwater fish, especially the popular fish. Um, clowns are very easy. That all clowns that fish that people would have, like I said, they they'll readily lay eggs in the tank. And if you have a tank or you know, quarantine tanks set up for that, it's not terribly difficult to to captive breed clownfish. So there are all sorts of designer breeds. You can get them in all white or white with black and orange. There's many colors of of clownfish. Um, but the more difficult fish have, have been the tangs. Um, and, and our tangs, are, our tangs were wild caught, uh, you know, 20 years ago. But now in the past four, five years, they've made some advancements in breeding yellow and blue tangs in captivity. And I, I guess they had success getting the fish to, to breed and lay eggs. But when the fish were still, you know, less than a quarter an inch, in size, um, they didn't know what the baby fish ate. 
Um, so that, there was lots of trial and error. Uh, some University of Florida, I believe, was involved with trying to feed the, um, the, the baby fish different live microorganisms um, so that they could grow. And then they, they were successful. And uh, now there's a big sort of push to move towards more captive bred fish and captive bred yellow tangs and captive bred blue tangs are, um, they're more expensive, but it is, it's very sustainable to have, to have a fish that, you know, its parents and its parents' parents were all uh, captive raised and not taken from the wild. Does anyone have any other questions about the fish or the corals? I have a question. What is the newest fish that we have in the tank? So the, um, the yellow lined wrasse is, is our newest fish. Um, I, I don't know how long ago we got him. Um, I know we got him when he was younger um, and he's grown, he's a very quick fish and he has grown quite a bit um, in the tank. I'm checking my documentation. Uh, and before the the RAS, the the Chromis that we got in 2013 were the most recent additions. We'd also gotten um, two or three clownfish um, in, I believe, 2012 or 2013. We have another question, one from Zach. Does the coral light up at night? Uh, so the, uh, we do turn the lights off at night. Um, some of them do glow sort of fluorescently, but we, we do not have any corals that glow in the dark. Um, let me grab something here. So uh, I, I controlled one of the lights just to show what it's like at a different time of day. Um, so if we Right now it's you know at the 2.46 in the afternoon time, but we can do a quick little playthrough of the tank. So this is you know midnight, this is the 4 a.m. lighting, it gets full dark around then, and then 6 a.m. the lights start to come on. Uh, may have, uh, yeah, I may have paused that. But the, the lights get brighter. And then we different color lights come on. Get, you know, the early morning light, the blue morning light, then the white light comes on for the full midday sun. And then as evening comes, the lights will start to get dimmer and dimmer until they fade back into sort of the blue evening sunset. Um, we we have been live streaming the um, the fish tank on the the library's YouTube channel. Um, it's something we've been doing this week. Um, it is something new uh, that we're doing and working out some of the interesting parts of YouTube, getting that stream running and staying up and running. But we we try and start the stream every day at noon if it's not running. This week, yep, tomorrow it'll definitely be. I will start the feed, the live stream on YouTube up again after we're done with this meeting. And um, yeah, it will be started up again tomorrow as well. Um, my boss has been doing a, uh, a great job uh, taking care of the fish tank uh, during COVID. He's been uh, getting water and making sure they're fed every day. Uh, so shout out to Eric Blevins, senior manager of the IT department, um, for making sure that the fish get taken care of. They they get, as I said before, a mix of frozen food and uh, seaweed. Uh, we we buy nori sheets just like you might use for sushi. Um, we just get 
sheets of nori and they we have a little clip and as soon as you drop a piece of nori into the tank blue will stop whatever he's doing and swim right over to it he wants that um and then we have a, a some a part of the fish control system there's a, an automatic pellet feeder that will um dump pellets into the tanks every few uh a couple times a day uh, we tried it um to sh show off during this uh, live event but the feeder is on the other side of the tank so if i were to live feed it would probably make all the fish disappear um so they got fed earlier today and they'll they'll get fed uh again this evening You can see some of the different fish peeking out. I see some cl a clownfish peeking out in the uh, sort of on the, the center left side of the tank. You can see those little flashes of orange. So a question about how often the fish get fed. Um, so we, like I said, we do a mixture of um, frozen foods and the nori seaweed as well as uh, the pellet feeding. Um, so they, they get fed at least once a day, uh, uh, easily upwards of four times a day. Uh, looking at the programming, they get fed at, at 10 a.m., uh, 1 p.m., and uh, 6 p.m. from the automatic um, robot feeder. And then uh, my boss has normally been coming in in the morning. Um, to check on them so he'll, they'll get their pellets or their frozen treat probably around 8 39 and that's when they um also get their seaweed uh when we were work when we were all at rit on campus uh we normally feed them their frozen food in the morning and then they would get their midday pellet snack and then I would normally put the uh, the seaweed into the tank to give them another snack towards the end of the day around five. But they get they get quite a bit of food. Uh, they do say they fast um, on or they 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 do they don't fast on the weekends anymore. They used to not get any food on Saturdays um, just because fish in the wild don't necessarily eat every day. And there is uh, quite a bit of algae in the tank that um, that many of them like to eat and snack on. So as it grows, Saturdays is the munching algae day. But many of the fish um, you'll see as you watch, especially the yellow tangs with their long pointed nose snout uh, that's made for grabbing algae off the rocks and eating it. And uh, I, I mentioned the, the temperature, but uh, the tank is 78.5 degrees. Uh, looks the pH is 7.98, which is something that actually the, the pH of the tank is is um, it's sort of something that I think is fun to watch as the um, as the building has different levels of people in it, um, those people breathe in the oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. And as the carbon dioxide dissolves into the water of the fish tank, it acidifies the water. And, and you can see um, changes in the pH of the tank, uh, you know, like when we go on Christmas break or when we come back from Christmas break, uh, just having people in the building uh, changes the, um, the pH of the water slightly. Not enough to cause any harm, but it's a, it's a thing that the logs show. Uh, another thing that affects the pH of the water is the, the light in the tank itself. As the, um, you know, as the photosynthetic, um, organisms that live inside the corals uh, consume the light or they use the light they'll consume carbon dioxide out of the water um, and then you know as the lights turn off on the main tank they may stop using doing photosynthesis in the main tank and the 
um, the algae chamber in the sump is set to run at nighttime so that it's counter to the, the main um, carbon dioxide usage of the upper tank to try and keep the levels a little bit more stable as well. Um, I can't remember if you said this, Justin, how long have we had the tank? Uh, we, we, the, we got the tank in 2001. I don't remember, it, um, I wasn't at RIT at the time, uh, but I don't remember when, I believe it was in the summer. Um, the tank was originally, um, and for many years, uh, in sort of when you walk into the library, you go past the circulation desk and it was over to the left in what we now call the community room or community area. And um, there, when we did the first floor renovations, um, the tank was brought to the center of the, um, the first floor. And I, I think a lot more people see it. And it's, it's an easier spot uh, with the furniture that's around it as well. It's a, it's a much nicer place to just hang out, study. I know a lot of different people say, meet me at the fish tank. Um, Everybody knows where the fish tank is in the library, and it's okay to stand by the fish tank and wait for a few minutes while you wait for your friends or, you know, whoever to show up. Asking about the, the coral without light. Um, coral, uh, just how, um, it, it, you know, the ocean has dark, stormy days. Um, the, the coral in the fish tank uh, could go you know a few days maybe a week or, or more without light um, there are lots of different you know problems with the fish tank where you might have a blackout period if you're if I've read about people having problems with algae and one way to help that is you know, turn off all the lights um, but what the corals can't go without is movement in the water they they need the water to be moving um, the, the cycling of the water from the top tank down to the bottom tank, and especially all the bubbles from the protein skimmer help keep the water oxygenated. So the moving water is very important. Um, and the temperature, uh, keeping a, a steady, or a safe temperature is also important. Um, but the movement of the water, um, when different people talk about planning for emergencies and disasters, uh, even if you can't light your tank and you can't, you know, filter your tank, if people will just, you know, take turkey basters and squirt water around the tank just to keep it moving, or they'll, um, you know, you scoop out of water in a pitcher and then you pour it back into the tank, and that adds a bunch of bubbles and it keeps the water moving. So the, the movement of the water. Is, is more important than the light or necessarily even the temperature. It can, can drop a little bit without hurting them, um, but the, the movement's important. So the, the library is fortunate that um, when the building was built, we had an emergency standby generator in the basement and uh, the fish tank is on that standby generator. So um, when the power goes out, uh, we have a, a battery that can keep the pumps going um, for that little split second, you know, until the generator kicks in and then all the power comes back to the tank and everybody's safe. Um, so the, the, the pumps, uh, you can, at the very top of the tank, you can see um, the waters being disturbed on the left and the right side. And those are the returns um, from the filtration equipment that's down below. So the water is always flowing um, through over the corner overflows. Let me zoom out a little bit. Um, so the corners of the tank, um, the, the dark areas, the water overflows a weir at the top and then falls down in. Um, and runs through the filtration equipment underneath the tank and then gets pumped back up under those uh, two sides of the tank or near the top. But then um, behind that, the, um, on each side of the tank, there's also a powerhead pump 
that circulates the water and um, that's behind a little piece of paper keeping the magnet in place. Um, so the, those power heads are controllable. Um, I bought those a bunch of years ago because I wanted them tank to have them. So it, I bought them and now I can control them. Um, and so they, they have different cycles that they run through, um, pulsing higher and lower. Um, they're always aimed in the same direction, um, but they're not always on the same speed. And earlier I showed off wave mode. I don't know if you were here, but I turned it back on and you can see when wave mode kicks in, both pumps on either side of the tank start to um, work in unison and it, gets the, the water column in the tank to sort, start rocking back and forth. And um, you can I kind of even see it at the, uh, the top water level of the tank, but you can definitely see it in the corals themselves that they, uh, they start to rock and just move around as the, uh, as the water, so it doesn't slosh, but as the water moves back and forth, and in the tank. And if you are in front of the tank, when wave mode kicks in, you might be able to hear a little bit, you know, as more water goes over the left water or overflow and then more over the right and over the left. Um, just says to provide something interesting in the tank and make sure that there's no stagnant water in the tank. So well, it's three o'clock, so I think we will wrap up. Uh, we'll be starting the live stream of the aquarium back up from the RIT Library's YouTube channel if you want to check it out. Um, the URL is youtube.com slash c slash RIT Libraries. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Justin, for a very informative talk. And interpreters, thank you as well. <laughs>